I'm in the third year of my PhD programme at the uh, University of Nottingham. I'm going to be talking today about a bit of a uh, sort of general approach we have for trying to deal with uh, models that we want to be quite generalizable across like a range of different experimental designs and we're really interested in model discrepancy and I'm going to talk about the sort of motivating problem that kind of led us down this path to um, start thinking about these things. So yeah, so structure wise, um, I'm going to start with like a simple sort of minimal introductory example for you to kind of uh, get the point across of um, what we're looking at and get us thinking along the right lines. Then I'm going to introduce the motivation a bit with a brief overview of the biology. Then I'm going to apply these sort of um, ideas to some synthetically generated data and finally finish off by showing you some of the, the real data that we've been looking at recently. Okay, so this is the simple uh, introductory example. So uh, we're interested in model misspecification or model discrepancy when there's a difference between the uh, model we're using to try and do our inference and make our predictions and uh, what is actually happening, like the real biology. Or, or, or. And uh, so here, the data generating process is um, this uh, y uh, t with uh, two exponentials. And let's say we don't know the correct equations we should be using and we try and fit something else that's a bit different with the only one exponential. So what ends up happening is, uh, depending on what experiment we use to train the model, um, i.e. which uh, time points we observe the system at, we'll get like very different parameter estimates. And uh, from that, we'll get lots of really different uh, predictions out when we try and uh, predict for other time points. So uh, here you can see these, all the colors of the different uh, parameter estimates we get out from the different experiments. And uh, there's a big difference between the different experiments and there's comparatively a lot less variability within the same experiment. And uh, particularly, we, we are interested in this kind of uh, limit when we observe lots of data. So here is like 100, uh, 10 times more observations. And the uh, sampling variance of these sampling distributions uh, shrinks uh, right down. So we're really interested in this kind of difference in where these things will end up when we're observing lots and lots of data. OK? So then the um, motivation for all this stuff is um, uh, modeling ion channel currents. Um, the one that I'm particularly interested in is a uh, potassium selective ion channel called HERG. And uh, this current is uh, pretty important in the heart. So these ion channels are, are proteins that will allow um, the, the potassium to uh, pass through and they snap between different conformations and uh, they're voltage sensitive. So when we put a different voltage signal through, um, that changes um, how much the current will, uh, the channel will allow current to flow. And uh, we're interested in modeling like the net effect of a large number of these channels over physiologically relevant timeframes, i.e. milliseconds and uh, seconds, like the timeframes um, related to the action potential. Uh, not so much like the femtoseconds and uh, really small time scales with the uh, molecular dynamic stuff. It's kind of like a big average approximation over many channels and over a good amount of time. Uh, the experiments that we do uh, look a bit like this. This is a bit of a simplified diagram from Chon Luck Lee's paper where I'm not including uh, a load of other electrical effects, but um, this is kind of an idealized version of the experiment. Essentially, you have the cell and you have a pipette attached to it and um, we have a circuit where current is flowing through the um, cell membrane and that cell membrane has pretty much only the um, type of currents that we're interested in. Uh, so what we do here is we decide what voltage we're going to put through the membrane at what times and then we record the currents. So the predictive task we're kind of interested in is can we take any voltage input and uh, do a good job of predicting exactly what the cell will do. Um, okay, so what do these models look like? Uh, as I said, we are interested in this kind of lots of uh, large number of channels kind of limit. So we just use ODE based models. Um, there's three examples on the right here, but there's really a lot of different 
uh, model structures you could write down. These are kind of just like a chemical reaction network and we have voltage uh, dependent functions on each of the transition rates. Um, and then we link them to the observation through uh, this kind of function, which is just, uh, it's a bit like um, V equals IR, but rearranged and there's a conductance here. So there's this V minus EKR acts a bit like a, a driving force where EKR is known as the reversal potential, which just comes from the concentrations of potassium inside and outside of the cell and temperature. Uh, there's this conductance scaling factor, um, which I'll come back to. And this uh, square brackets with the O is simply the proportion of all the channels that have uh, found their way into this open conformation, which is the only one that will allow current to flow through. Um, yeah. Uh, so, moving on to uh, the synthetic data stuff I want to show you. Um, what we have here is five on the top row, that's um, uh, the five different voltage protocols or experiments that we performed. And this is the input that we put into the cell. And on the bottom is some like uh, simulated output on what the current will look like. So yeah, we're dealing with millivolts and uh, nanoamps here. It's, it's quite small. Um, so here's a figure with like lots of information to take in. So with this first example, what we do is we take that G, which is a scaling factor, and then we intentionally fix it to incorrect values and see how the model uh, manages to uh, account for that and reach certain compromises. So this middle row is uh, lambda, the scaling factor equals one. So that's when the model is exactly the model that we use to um, generate the data. Um, with, uh, so we just take that ODE and we add uh, Gaussian additive noise. And as you might expect here, we've designed all the experiments in such a way that we can recover the parameters very accurately and no matter which of these um, those experimental designs we chose to train the model to, we do really good predictions. And um, so the middle is uh, trying to predict this uh, this voltage signal, which uh, it looks a bit like a, an action potential or a bunch of action potentials in a row. So that's kind of physiologically relevant, and they'll do a good job at predicting that. And on the right, this is like a cross-validation heat map of training to each design and trying to predict every other design. So yeah, when there's no model discrepancy, everything works fine and you can predict everything really well and the model's good. But you know, if we um, fix this scaling factor to different values, that's not the case. And um, it's almost like a continuum sliding scale of model discrepancy. So as we get closer towards the correct model, we, we expect this to happen. Um, so, Here's just another one with the uh, from the middle column of the, these like spreads in predictions. So we, we take all the different parameter sets we obtain from the different experiments, and then we get an, an ensemble of uh, different sort of predictive models to to use. So in, in the first case, there's there's a big disagreement between them on what exactly should happen under this action potential thing because the model is discrepant, and uh, there's a bit less when you make the uh, conductance too big because they can seemingly compromise with that a little bit better. Um, so yeah, we're thinking of uh, this as like a sort of realistic bound on um, our trust in the model predictions for like any unseen voltage uh, that we're not sure about, uh, even when the model is uh, discrepant. Uh, the second example is really about can we um, use this to find the correct model? So there's these two model structures here. Uh, we generated the, the with this uh, model C structure, and um, you can quite clearly see that everything covers all these parameters. Everything's consistent. Uh, the training validation heat map looks completely uniform. Uh, but yeah, when we have the wrong model, it's a bit misspecified. Um, that's not the case, and things are a bit different. Okay. Um, so moving on to the sort of real data. Um, so we, we use these uh, high throughput uh, automated uh, patch clamp machine, which uh, essentially does a load of these experiments all at once on 384 different cells. Um, we boosted up the number of experimental designs to 12. Um, so the, these 12 designs get applied sequentially to each well. 
Um, and we actually repeat the first uh, experiment uh, four times just to make sure that we're getting the same output each time we run the experiment because there can be some sort of stability issues and things changing over, over the course of the minutes that this is happening with a real biological cell. So because of that, we do only end up with data that we want to use for a smaller, small proportion of the cells. Um, so I actually relabeled all the different protocols, not that it really matters that much, but th these are all the ones we're we're interested in using now. So it's, there's, a, there's a lot more of them. And um, this D5 was that uh, validation protocol we uh, looked at previously. Um, yeah, so what happens when we fit all these different things? So we're fitting a model to each cell and, and protocol pair. So here we're looking at all the parameter sets we get back from uh, one cell. And the orange ones are all the repeats um, of that same D0 protocol. And they get us back something quite similar, but the, there's a big spread in all the other predictions because of we've got them from doing different experiments. This is essentially what I'm trying to show you here. And the pink is just a reference parameter set, which up there. Um, OK, so on some of the protocols like this D0 one, um, we do a really good job. Uh, and it looks like the model fits uh, really quite well. Um, so th these are the Model A and Model B structures, and th they both do a pretty good job. Uh, on this uh, other protocol, which was D4, uh, not so much. Um, we, if you maybe can't quite see, but there are um, bits of the protocol where we're seeing a lot of model discrepancy, and neither one can really uh, um, fully capture the behavior that we're looking at, which obviously has an impact on the parameter estimates we obtain. Um, so because of this, when we take all those parameter sets from all the different experiments and plug them back into that nice validation protocol, we, we do see a big um, spread in these predictions, um, which does indicate that the, the model isn't quite capturing and isn't uh, like a perfect model for every possible voltage signal we've seen. Uh, so again, this is kind of about how much we'd trust the output of the model if you were to give us uh, a new voltage protocol. Uh, we wouldn't uh, trust it to be any more accurate than the width of this bound uh, in, in a vague sense. Um, so yeah, so from these two structures, we can then look at those uh, heat maps again. And uh, we can see the, these lighter squares here are actually all from those um, D0 um, protocols and some of the protocols uh, you can see that end up having a lot of error under prediction. Um, so we're, we're thinking of using this as a way for us to select the most suitable model possible. Um, you know, we, you could look at the, the average of this heat map and you'd find that the B, the more complicated model, uh, is slightly better. But if you look at the the darkest square or where the most error is, you'd see that model A is ever so slightly better. So there's a bit of a choice of exactly what metric you should be using. And I guess that comes down to, you can think if we're uh, picking training and validation protocols at random, um, you know, what's the chance that we end up with a really bad model or a really bad prediction? There's sort of thinking about interpreting it that way. Uh, so that, that's about everything I wanted to say. Um, yeah, so we're hoping to use this cross-validation with other protocols to try and select the most useful model, especially from a um, much uh, greater number of potential candidate models than I've shown here. Um, we, we think that you know, th these variabilities in the predictions is like a good way of getting a handle on how much model discrepancy there is in a kind of meaningful way um, that you know, actually relates to uh, what we're trying to use the models for. And the last part is just a bit of a, uh, yeah, we, we should kind of be aware of where we've got the parameters from for our models when we know that there's a lot of model discrepancy. Because depending on what we're using the model for, um, those parameters, you know, might not be the best choice. And maybe you should have chosen a more suitable experiment. Uh, so with that, the synthetic data stuff is in that first um, reference, uh, which is a preprint that you can probably Google. And uh, the second reference there is a really good uh, sort of primer on this kind of modeling program, uh, 
sort of modeling problem that we're interested in. And um, yeah, finally, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, a whole bunch of people. So there's my supervisors uh, on the left side, so Gary Myrams, Simon Preston, uh, Dominic Whitaker, who supervised me for a bit and now has gone to work at GSK, and John who, at Macau. And uh, the people that did all the experiments for us are all based at the uh, Victor Chang Cardiac Research Institute. So in particular, uh, Monique Windley ran the experiments and uh, yeah, Adam Hill and James Vandenberg have given us some really good feedback as well. Uh, yeah, so I'm a bit ahead of schedule, but I'm happy to answer uh, any questions you've got for me. And uh, thanks for your attention. You mentioned the use you were going to put the model to. Um, <clears throat> is, um, uh, is the objective to have predictive power, or are you actually looking to explain uh, the process? So. Yeah, and so that's, it's a good question, because I think we're in between <laughs> both of them. Uh, because one of the reasons why you want to do this sort of modeling is to get a good model structure. So when you look at um, how drugs interact with this protein channel, um, you can model that as well. So actually uncovering, um, getting a bit of uh, intuition or uh, in the interpretability of the model is quite important for that. So we are kind of trying to um, uh, look at that. But then, uh, yeah, we're hoping that by finding the model that predicts the best, that will give us a good idea of the correct model structure. Which, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I guess I had a question about, uh, at the moment you're fitting your model separately to each of the training protocols uh, individually. Yes. What happens if you, you, you pull all the data and then fit it together? For, for one cell for every protocol? Um, yeah, we haven't actually uh, tried that yet, even though it's, uh, it's something we want to do. Um, I expect you'd, you'd just get another parameter set that isn't any better than any of the other parameter sets in a, in a general sense. It would just reach a decent compromise for for everything. So, um, yeah, it would be good to look at just how well it can do in that sense. It's a good point and something we should. Yeah, I guess I was just wondering if the uncertainty that you get if you were fitting it in like a Bayesian way might encompass all of the other individual parameter sets. I suspect not because of model discrepancy, but it would still be interesting to look at. Yeah, because there's um, so many data points, what I think what you'd expect to happen is just have a posterior that shrinks around around some parameter sets and seeing a massive amount of discrepancy between the model and that best fitting parameter set. Um, so in that case, the parameter set wouldn't actually be much more useful in a general sense, is what we're thinking. I just thought of another question. So um, uh, I was just wondering, you've, you've used a very simple error structure, just a Gaussian noise on top. Um, uh, and I, I do wonder if you actually had more sophisticated error, you know, possibly related to the individual components. Uh, it would make your model um, certainly less easy to fit, but you might actually avoid this problem of the parameters homing in on different points, because at, at, at the moment, the uh, the error is not actually allowing much wriggle room uh, for the model. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's definitely something I want to look at at some point, um, but I, I still feel we'll see a lot of um, the protocol dependence. And um, yeah, part of the reason why we've kept to the simple model here is because we're really we're quite interested in trying to select the um, best structure. And if we start also trying to select the best uh, error model at the same time, um, that's that's going to be quite tricky to unpick all that. Um, so yeah, we're hoping that most of the problem is the um, is is uh, from these uh, different structures um, or other things we can add into the deterministic model. Uh, I do have a follow-up question on the modeling side. So at the moment you have a deterministic model, and then you add this. Uh, Gaussian noise on top. Uh, have you tried uh, using your your approach in the case where the the, the initial model is directly an SDE? Yeah, I haven't um, tried that myself. Uh, there is uh, some of that in the field. I, I guess the reason we haven't done it here is because um, we're hoping that the effect of uh, maybe an SDE um, style model will be very small compared to all the other sources of uncertainty that we have. 
Um, but yeah, it's definitely something people are doing and I would like to look at as well. Let's thanks Joseph again. Yeah.